I have a confession. I've been spending a lot of time with IT department stuff here in my home office. And if one more tech support man, me explains to me, I will find him and karate chop him in the throat. <laughs> I swear to God. And if you're a man listening, please just stop me explaining. Stop me explaining. You're just not stop in the studio. Just stop it. Just stop, stop it. Stop me explaining. <sighs> Jesus. <sighs> All right. Let's get started. Sybil, I'm an esthetician and spa owner. And hi, I'm Alex Ellis. I'm a body nerd and wellness expert, and we are business besties. And bosses, running your own business, it's hard. But we're terrible employees, so we're figuring it out. I've already figured it out, but we promise to share everything we know about what it takes to make a, make a six-figure income. And be brutally honest about what works and what totally sucks. I'll be honest, a bunch of it totally sucks, but let's go ahead and get started. Yes. Welcome, welcome, welcome back to Skin Fashional. On today's show, uh, we have someone who's super awesome who is going to blow your mind with everything you ever wanted to know about trademarks and more. We also weirdly get into a lot about peeps for some reason. Yeah, and sweet tea. Sweet tea. Sweet tea. Um, but it's all super, super, super important. So our guest today is Takora Davis, um, who is a trademark attorney who uh, Sybil is working with. And I am. She's totally, I mean, she's such a badass. Um, I met her through a mastermind and uh, I'll tell the story in the interview of one of my first memories of her and embarrass the pants off her. Um, but she, her law firm is called the Creators Law Firm and they focus on uh, trademarks for creative entrepreneurs and really helping you to protect your smarts. So I know that many of you um, might be transitioning into the online space, even if you are not transitioning into the online space, but you have big, bold goals and dreams for your business and where it's going to go. Um, to Cora and her conversation that we had today uh, is so, so, so important. And as you're listening, also, I want you to know that by the end, that same feeling I got when we were talking about money, and it made me really uncomfortable about needing to take action. It happened again. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, I think it's important to know that she is growing as a business. So if you are looking for other legal services, she might very well be able to help you. Oh, yeah. I'm like, take my money. Sign me up. Yeah. But also, all money. <laughs> if you're at the place where you're like, you know, I'm not quite ready yet for that investment, just put a pin in it and know that this is so super important because ultimately at the end of the day, um, your brand, your business is your intellectual property. And it's really, really super important to protect it. Uh, because what else do you have? Yeah. And one of the, my favorite parts of this interview is she gives us really amazing suggestions on how to think of names for your business, good names for your next intellectual property mm -hmm. or your next kind of endeavor. Which is the hardest thing ever. Oh, it's so hard. All right. So we could go on and on, but let's just go straight into our talk today with Takora Davis. Woo! All right. Today we are here with attorney Takora Davis Esquire. <laughs> we were talking about all of her wonderful titles because she is a brilliant, brilliant entrepreneur and business owner. And we are so excited to talk with her today um, because she is going to blow our minds about trademarks and business and um, I, you guys need to watch the video to see her kick butt backdrop. It is yes. phenomenal. So to Cora, <laughs> welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you guys for inviting me. I'm so excited to be here today and share my smarts with you all. Yes, there yeah. are so, so, so many smarts. Um, so before we dive in, do you want to just give a, a brief overview, if you will, um, of who you serve and how you help them? Sure, sure. So, um, as obviously, I'm attorney to Cora Davis. I'm the founder of the Creators Law Firm, and we help experts, entrepreneurs, and everyday women protect their brands so they can grow their business with peace of mind. So, we are working with inventors, coaches, consultants, um, people who are crafters, artisans, really anyone who is having, you know, really big dreams and they want to make sure they're protected. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say that I'm working with attorney to Corey Davis, <laughs> Davis um, with trademark for my stuff. So, and I'm an esthetician and I reached out to her because Alex gave me her information and uh, she's been working with me on trademark because, you know, estheticians, we have to uh, work on our 
you know, property and stuff as well, our trademarks. Mm-hmm. That's right. I know I need to follow up with you too. <laughs> I'm, I'm down, you know. Um, Alex and I, we met. Oh, wait, did we stay at the same? No. Yeah, we I, were I in, we met where, oh, in the mastermind together. Right. I was trying to remember because it was such a cute little house you guys were staying at, I think. And I'm like, I just remember like we just had such a good time at dinner and we were just laughing all the time. It's, we just had such a good it's always good to meet someone in person, obviously, when the world was open. Right. But it's so good to like be able to be like, oh, my gosh, you're the person who's behind that computer screen that I've been interacting with with, for months. And a lot of people are like really shocked that I'm as short as I am (laughs) because people think that I'm like five, seven. I'm like, I'm not even five, two, like I round (laughs) up on my driver's license. So it's always fun to interact with people and like have a connection, have a good memory. So. Mm -hmm. And I remember when we first met, um, we went out to eat dinner and, um, it was my first time in, we were in North Carolina. I don't know if you remember. I already know what you're about to say. Um, and you ordered tea and it wasn't sweet tea. And you were like, what is this? Like, you were so upset. And I was just like, wait, I don't understand. I'm from California. Like, what is sweet tea? And it was just like such a, such a bad thing that they did not have sweet tea. (laughs) Well, I I just, I just felt totally disrespected. You're in North Carolina and you have the unmitigated gall to have your restaurant here. You're telling me that sweet tea is not on the menu. It is a staple. It is a hallmark. I am surprised that it is not the drink of North Carolina. You know, we have our state bird. We have our state flag. We should have our state drink and it should be sweet tea. But yeah, I, and I remember having this, con- first of all, I ordered it. I sipped it and I almost spit it out. It was just like, oh, this is not pleasing to my palate, no. you know? And you kind of were like, what's sweet tea? And I was just like, gasp, <laughs> you know? That's I just felt for you. I felt for you. I, I remember, I was like, when you started talking about that, I was like, she's already going to talk about this moment <laughs> about me and the sweet tea thing, you know? And for me, it's, it's probably one of the worst things that I can experience. You know, for me, it's like, don't lie lie to me. Don't steal from me. Don't leave me a nasty voicemail and don't serve me unsweet tea in your restaurant. Like those are the four things. If you don't want to be my friend, do any of those four things. <laughs> it is yeah. Yeah. Oh my well, god! Every time I have tea though, I do think of you and I'm like, oh, Tequila would not approve of this tea. <laughs> oh my goodness. I would not. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Well, then that brings up a good point. So so I was going to start with what is trademark, but one of the questions that I had for you when I first met you was, can somebody who's not in North Carolina work with you because you're in North Carolina and I am clearly in California? So we're going to start with that question and then we'll get back to kind of what is trademark. Yeah, I love that question um, because many people think, oh, you know, I can't work with someone or an attorney outside of my state for this particular matter. And so just a little bit of a constitutional, historical, AP government 101 uh, kind of uh, course, Uh, there's, you know, we have the state laws and then we have federal laws, right? And so uh, state laws are things that are governed by, you know, what's happening in your state. And so this is why some people can only get like a family law attorney or a criminal law attorney if someone was speeding, you know, you you broke the law in that particular state. So generally those laws are governed by state laws. And so you'll need a local license attorney or a state license attorney. The type of law that I practice is federal law, very similar to uh, immigration law. Um, that's underneath the executive branch of the government. So, you know, we have um, judicial branch, legislative branch, and executive branch. And so the executive branch of the government governs the United States Copyright Office as well as the United States Patent Office. And the reason why is because Congress, which is underneath the legislative branch, they deal with interstate commerce. That Mm -hmm. means business transactions that cross state lines. And because trademarks on a federal level must have some type of nexus with another state and crossing state lines, meaning that you have offered your services to someone else or you've sold a product in a state outside of yours, it falls underneath 
the federal government. And because of that, I can represent clients all across the United States um, and even the world. You know, if people are saying, hey, I reside in another country, but I'd like to file a, a United States trademark, they need to hire an attorney. So, um, yeah, so I can represent people from all across the country, which is so exciting. I have this map where I kind of pin all of my clients. And so it's really cool. And I'm like, I don't have someone in that state. You know, and I get really excited. Oh, that is exciting. That is exciting. Um, so go ahead and talk for a second then what is trademark and why people might need it? Yeah. So a trademark, really, if you look at the name, it's what's in the name. It is a mark and your mark could be a name, tagline, logo, very rare cases. It can be a color. It can be a scent and it can be a sound. Very, very rare. But any type of mark that helps people identify your trade and your trade is your business. And so that is really what a trademark is. It is some type of mark that helps people identify your brand as the source. So even thinking of like, you know, at the beginning of the movies, I don't even know which movie studio it is, but they have the lion and the lion just roars. Mm -hmm. I believe that they have a trademark on that because when you experience that, you're like, oh, this sound is helping me identify this particular uh, company. That's MGM. And so, <laughs> yeah. 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 See, <laughs> right. And so, uh, in, in T Mobile, st- uh, no, not T Mobile, um, Verizon stores, I think when you walk in, there's actually a smell that's like a vanilla musk scent that they pump into each store. Oh, and they yeah. have that smell trademark oh, because each store has the smell. And so that's, that's a part of their trade dress. It's a part of them creating that same environment so that no matter what store you walk into, even the smell, every store will smell the same. Mm -hmm. Um, So that can even lend itself to trademarks. And then of course we have colors like T-Mobile has the magenta pink trademark, but the key for a color mark is that it is trademark to be used just like any other trademark in connection with that specific Um, service. Mm -hmm. So if another phone company came out with some type of pink color in their marketing that's very closely resembled to the T-Mobile, obviously there would be litigation. And that has happened because T-Mobile saw another company. I can't remember, but they sued them. Yeah, Cricket. cricket. Yeah, yeah, Yeah. because of that. And so, um, but most often what we deal with are business names, taglines, logos, Honestly, your trademark is probably one of the most valuable, if not the most valuable business asset that you own. It's often the least protected. And the reason why it's one of the most valuable is because this is how people can determine uh, and help to identify and distinguish your program, your offerings, your products, your services from a competitor or counterpart. This is how people are going to come to follow you, join your email list, enroll in your, your program. And really, there's value prestige, uh, good, good reputation associated with many marks and many people's names. And on the alternative, there's negative experiences associated with people's names as well. And so it behooves you from a business standpoint to protect the asset and protect your reputation by making sure you have a federal trademark, because this is the only way that you can get full ownership rights to your brand name by getting and obtaining and maintaining a federal trademark registration. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, if someone pops up and they are using the same name as you um, and they're doing something similar, it could confuse your customers. And, you know, you could slide in someone's DMs or their email and say, hey, that's my name. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Please remove it. But without a federal registration, it would be very difficult for you to do so. Um, Or... Facebook or YouTube, Vimeo, Instagram, they're not going to remove that infringing content because you don't have any type of ownership that you can point to and show proof of. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's a lash company that I know of. um, So in purview to the people who listen to us, there's a lash company I know of that they were doing business and they were making millions of dollars. And they recently found out that they've been doing business for about a year that their name was owned by a very small little company that I trademarked it about three years ago and they tried to purchase it. They went through litigation and the company, the small little company was like, nah, we're not going to, we're just going to sue you for a lot of money. 
Cool. And they came out a huge winner in that. And it was really hard in the lash company because they're a really large lash company. Well, and also yeah. when you build your whole company under this brand and then you have to change it, you, yeah. know, you lose that. And they, had, they had to change it and they actually changed it twice because they found out that the other name that they were looking for also wasn't working out. It was a huge <laughs> mess. Just do a Google search and then a... Well, but they owned the URL. So they thought, oh, I own the URL. These people uh, don't have the URL. It must be fine. So just because you search for the URL doesn't mean you own the trademark, guys. You'd, right. Does that, and, and even... Or I was just okay. saying, does that give you any kind of protection uh, or just like establishing before you file a trademark or anything? No, not really. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> as, because, as you know, a lot of court. Yeah. A lot of people think, well, I found, I filed my LLC and in my state, my, my state approved the name. The state is just checking to see is anyone else in this state using the same or similar business name. They're not even doing a, a state trademark search. And why is that? Well, you can have the exact same name as another company as long as there's not confusion that would be imminent, mm-hmm. which is why we have what I like to call brand twins. So we see this with Pandora Jewelry, Pandora Music, Dove Chocolate, Dove Soap, right. Delta Airlines, Delta Faucets. So just because someone has a URL, it doesn't necessarily mean that, oh, well, they have ownership rights. Also, even filing an LLC does not even start the common law trademark rights. So sometimes you have very limited trademark rights if you've been doing business and making sales, but you have to, the key is you have to offer a product, you have to offer a service, you have to receive some type of compensation or provide an experience in connection with it. And so that is the triggering point that starts your trademark rights. Many times people will purchase a domain, file the LLC, and they don't do one thing with the business. Hello, somebody. I'm preaching to the choir because I did that one time. <laughs> I was like, we're going to start this vending company. We filed the <laughs> LLC. We got the URL. We didn't do a darn thing. Good, You know, rest in peace, milestone vending. It, nothing <laughs> came of it. Tell your you mom, know? tell your friends, sell something. <laughs> right. And the all- key is you want to you know, doing that across state lines, but, you know, we're doing that at minimum within your own state. And so that's the key. You know, there has to be some type of movement across state lines where Mm. you're affecting interstate commerce. And that's the triggering point where you're like, okay, I can get, or at least secure a pathway to federal trademark protection. Now, alternatively, you could file a trademark application and say, I intend to use this particular name across state lines, or I intend to use this name in the future. Essentially, that's called an intent to use trademark application. That's basically you letting the world know, this is mine. I'm putting my name on it. I'm not quite ready to launch, but I'm locking the name down, or at least I'm reserving my spot in line to use this name before anyone else. And that means even if someone comes across, let's say, for instance, we file an intent to use trademark for you. One month later, you're like, Takora, I'm still developing my brand, totally not ready to launch. But some digital hamburglar, as I like to call folks, they come (laughs) and they (laughs) will say, okay, I'm going to take this person's name or I'm just going to take the name and I'm going to launch a a competitive, uh, the same type of services or products. And I'm going to provide sales and they actually get their business up and running before you. Well, you filed your trademark application before them. So you still have priority. That's how powerful the trademark application is. Even if somebody starts the business before you, the fact that you actually filed your application before them means that you got in line before them. Mm, Now, eventually, eventually you still have to prove that you actually got your business up and running and that you are providing sales. But you could actually, on the strength of that application, send those individuals a cease and desist and request they stop. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm, the awesome. cease and desist. Yeah. <laughs> so what is the difference between trademark and copyright for somebody who really needs to know the difference? All right. So a copyright is, I'm going to give you the legal definition that I totally hate. And then I'm going to give you the definition <laughs> that I like. So the copyright is going to protect a literary or artistic work in a fixed, tangible medium. What that means is... 
<laughs> a copyright is going to protect a book, a poem, audio, photo, video, something type of creative work that you have kind of put into a form that can be experienced by other people. And so that's what copyright protects. So this could be a course. It could be a worksheet or a handout. It could be a blog or a series of blogs, photos, videos, choreography, sculptures, graphic design, that type of stuff. So that is what copyright protects. Even your website. That's why a lot of times you see the copyright at the end of the website. Copyright protects that. Now, the difference between the two is that the trademark could maybe protect the business name Mm. that is, you know, that underneath that business name, there are things on the website or there are things in the book. The trademark is going to protect the mark that helps people identify the content, the courses, the products, the goods that are happen to be housed on the website or housed within the book. So that's the difference between the two. Trademark is your name. Trademark is going to help people identify your brand. And then copyright is going to protect the actual work and probably the product itself that you're producing underneath that trademark. Both are very important, but they do kind of serve two different functions with respect to intellectual property. I look at intellectual property like an umbrella, you know, so I'm going to do a comparison. There's an umbrella and underneath the umbrella that I'm sitting under is criminal law. Right. Um, So we're just going to do a comparison first. And so you're like, okay, I'm underneath the umbrella of criminal law and I'm a digital hamburglar. That's just who I am. That's my my. (laughs) That's my, you know, my disguise. Right. And so I'm driving down the highway at 100 miles an hour and I'm totally breaking the law right now. And I get pulled over and they give me a speeding ticket. Well, speeding ticket is a crime. Right. And so that's a type of crime that falls underneath the umbrella of criminal law. And then I'm like, I'm really a bad guy and I'm going to purse snatch an old lady, you know. (laughs) And so obviously robbing someone (laughs) is also a type of crime. Right. But they both fall underneath the umbrella, the overarching umbrella of criminal law. Similarly, intellectual property has its own umbrella. And underneath that umbrella, you have trademarks, copyrights, patents, personality rights, which is the right for you to be able to control your name, your image, your likeness uh, before and even after death. And then trade secrets. So they all fall underneath this umbrella, but they have different functions. And so patents protect inventions, or sometimes patents can even protect the ornamental features, meaning the design of a product packaging. The Coca-Cola bottle has Mm -hmm. a patent. Those disgusting, terrible peeps, marshmallow (laughs) candies that come out every Easter. And I don't understand why this company is still existing. That actually has a patent, a design patent. Again, don't understand it, but you know, peeps are so like they're here for like the truth of them or for like the, yeah. So peeps yeah. are all the time now. So you just, you know, they're like Halloween peeps and they're yeah. Christmas peeps and peeps all the time. <laughs> this is, that's, that's horrible. That's probably the fifth thing uh, after the sweet tea that I do not I like. Know. Don't give that to me. If someone sent that to me, I'm like, they're not my friend. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God, for the revelation. Now can I know. We can have a whole um, conversation about sweet tea versus not sweet tea, or hard peeps, soft peeps, or no peeps. <laughs> why, why? Always zero peeps. Why, well, well, why are there? Is, there is a hard peep. Yeah. So we can just you open up the peeps, and then you let, let them go, go stale. stale. It should be stale peeps, fresh peeps, zero <laughs> peeps. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I've blown my mind by the whole steel peeps, but like this is a thing. Like my mom's obsessed with steel peeps. What's going on? Like we gotta we gotta get your mom something else. I mean, I don't know. We gotta send her, but there's more to life. We gotta get we gotta diversify our palate because I'm concerned. Steel peeps. Whoa. Steel peeps. Okay. It's a big thing. Interesting. Is a thing. Interesting. A thing. Okay. 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 Good to know. Weirdos out here in California. I think is all that we are proving right now. <laughs> What's that going on? Well, if, I right. would say if if uh, North Carolina is a sweet tea, we are the green smoothies in California. Mm-hmm. Green smoothies, okay. we got shots. Okay. They taste terrible. They do. Yeah, it's true. It's true. Uh, I've seen those. So I have a question about copyright because uh, yeah, I 
I don't have my trademark yet. And I feel really bad saying that because I don't want a, a digital hamburger to come and steal my whole business <laughs> idea. Um, but the copyright, so the trademark, you know, is something that you file and you work with an attorney to do it properly so that you're not just spending time and money on one of those like legal Zoom type of things. But for copyright, is it enough to just put the like C at the bottom of my website? And like, does that actually cover me or is that like fake? <laughs> It's real. It's very real. Okay. So the cool thing about copyright is the moment that you create a literary or artistic work, copyright attaches. Whether you put the designation, the copyright by your company in the year or not. But the thing about it is, is that some people will strategically register, which is what I encourage picking and choosing the works that you would like to register because nobody knows that you're the owner because there is no registration. There's no type of copyright registration in order. So you own it already. Totally fine if you would like to even put the copyright notice at the end of the website or even if you're doing like presentations, giving handouts to, mm-hmm. you know, clients and things like that, you can put the copyright symbol at the bottom. It may behoove you to say, hmm, this is a piece of intellectual property that I'm really building an empire off of that, you know, people are coming into my program, they're experiencing this, they're watching the content on the videos. I want to make sure that I register the copyright that is associated with my flagship offer because you're monetizing it. And let's be real. Some people are monetizing courses, whether they're 197 or 1997, and it's making them, you know, thousand heirs or, you know, hundred thousand heirs or millionaires. Right. And there's, there's value attached to it. Um, the benefits of registering the copyright is one, it proves that, or it's, it's really something that you can refer back to and say, Hey, I am the legal owner of this copyright Two, Um, it will assist you in the event someone does infringe on your work and you have to negotiate for the settlement of attorney's fees. Um, that can be included when you have a registered tr- copy right by statute, but if it's not registered, you cannot get reimbursement for attorney's fees. Mm. Um, finally, you will also be able to sue in federal court. Um, and so having that registration is going to be better. Federal court is often better than state court because when you're going to probably be dealing with judges, that are a little bit more savvy. They understand these laws better. Also, the case will likely be held in a more expedited manner um, because the cases just aren't backlogged there. Also, there's a higher statutory relief that you could claim due to the infringement. Um, and so there's benefits to registering the copyright to your creative works for that reason. Mm. Mm. Okay. So guys, if you really want to protect something, you know, you spent a lot of time making that uh, course, that ebook, whatever, think about it. Think about mm-hmm. it. Yeah. And about if it. somebody were to be, you know, I'm thinking of some of our spa owners who aren't necessarily crossing state lines unless they are shipping product. Um, but if you're just like working local within your state, is a trademark really necessary or... Or not? Yeah, I think that in that sense, you should strongly consider a state trademark um, because that's very real for some people, whether they're restaurant owners or they have, you know, some type of um, business that really, really, really serves the customers and clients in that particular state. This could be, you know, I think of like local service providers like. Um, handymen, maids, um, commercial cleaning, residential cleaning, all of those can be super profitable. Mm -hmm. Um, My husband and I are getting our residential and commercial cleaning business up and running. And we know that this could be a huge moneymaker, especially in light of the environment that we're currently in. Right. And so it behooves us to make sure at minimum we have a state trademark. Why? Because if other people are looking for other people who are providing this locally, it's good for them to be able to distinguish your business from someone else's. And there have been times like one of my clients, he had, I have all sorts of amazing clients. So don't judge him, (laughs) but he made custom gold grills. I actually, I was my, one of my dreams is to have just grills on the bottom, like a bar. I know that sounds crazy, but I was like, I made a Facebook status and I was like, this is my secret dream. I want to have grills on the bottom and that's it. And I'm running away. And other people were like, me too. Oh my gosh, I'm Sophista Ratchet as well. Right. And so we bonded on that status. But anyway, so this particular client is awesome, awesome guy, but he has this name and he's referred to by that. 
And someone else in the same city, not too far, put up a sign that has his exact same name. Oh my God. And so what happened was people were coming to the counterfeit site, the infringer site, um, and they were saying, oh, this is the same person we're hearing about on the radio. This must be his second location. Oh, God. And so they were going in there, getting grills done. Grills were breaking. You know, all sorts of stuff was happening. Their mouth was being irritated because he was, they were using like, you know, less than seller products. And then of course, miraculously, now you find the real source and you're like, Hey, your other, your other location did this wrong to me. And he's like, I don't have another location. And they're like, yes, you do. So he's like, what? So he drove by the place and they have this huge banner, you know, with his name. And so I had to send a cease and desist and tell them to remove it and all that type of stuff. And if someone did call that they were to direct traffic or direct the clients, back to that particular source. And so unfortunately, if you're not careful, something like that could have really damaged his reputation and the um, credibility and the um, credibility associated with his brand, but even his product, because yeah. people were assuming or they were going to assume and like, oh, this is actually an inferior product. And so that will ultimately hurt his bottom line. So a state trademark could be a great thing for someone in that particular situation. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's intense. Well, speaking of all of that, so when somebody's thinking about doing this, you know, I know that when I first started, I was like, I went online and I'm like $49 for a trademark. That seems great. And Alex was like, don't you do it. <laughs> don't you dare. Don't you do it. So I'd heard enough <laughs> stories from you to Cora. Like, don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> so what should people do? What should people look for? How much should they, what, what really is a ballpark estimate for it. Like, let's get down to brass tacks about this. Let's get real. That's what we talk about here. All right, let's get really real. So if you're going to work with an experienced attorney, I really think you need to invest anywhere from two to three K and up when it comes to protecting your brand. Um, and so, yes, you can maybe go to some online sites and possibly get it done for much cheaper. But here's the thing, those companies, they are not licensed attorneys and they will tell you that in their website disclaimer. And they'll even say, we are not meant to replace a licensed attorney. What I think is extremely comical is that LegalZoom actually hired a lawyer to file their own trademark. <laughs> they didn't even use their own service. Oh I was God. like, what? I thought it was crazy. I was like, well, wait a minute. You know, if you guys are doing such a great job, why wouldn't you use your own service? Because they know the value of a good attorney. So they got their they got their their own logo filed with a law firm. So I was like, what? So anyway, um, so that's one of the things. Two, LegalZoom will not properly counsel you. So, you know, Sybil, we talked a lot about what to put into yeah. your particular classes. Is there anything else that we can include? Because it's not just one thing per class. There's mm -hmm. tons of things that could be housed all within one class. Unfortunately, I'm dealing with the situation right now where a client of mine, they went to LegalZoom and LegalZoom did not ask them enough questions. And so she filed her trademark and it really covered one set of services that she was offering because she, but she could have very well included more in that same class, particularly as it related to a specific product that she was selling. And so she didn't include the products that she was selling. She only focused on her services. Lo and behold, a month and a half, two months later, someone else who did hire an attorney files her exact same business name, but for products. And guess what? The trademark office said, they can get that trademark because mm -hmm. they were so they were a little dissimilar. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, she's in this situation now where she's like, what do I do? Do I oppose it? Do I even have the money to oppose it? I really don't. I'm going to have to figure out where to get the money from. But if LegalZoom would have just asked her a few more questions, she would not even be in this position. Mm -hmm. Right. She, she literally would not be in this position because she would have gotten the full protection for the same amount of money that she paid. But because they could not really ask her questions, they really just took what she and put into the form. And then they said, OK, these are the classes. Right. And so that's the tough part. You're not getting adequate counsel when you go to some of these sites because they literally cannot advise you. Like when you work with an attorney, you're paying for the legal counsel and the advisement. My job for my clients and I tell them and I say, my job is to remove any legal target that is on your business's back. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to make sure that we do that and we tell you what you need to know, not what you want to hear to make that happen. And so yeah. unfortunately, 
you know, it's, it's just, and I'm not saying that that couldn't happen with an attorney. You could work with a less than experienced attorney and maybe that same thing could occur, but I've seen it happen one too many times with those uh, sites such as LegalZoom. Also, LegalZoom is being sued constantly for the unlicensed practice of law. Oh, um, you know, non, non-attorneys cannot practice law. And so there's a reason why attorneys go to school and they get the requisite knowledge. And then we have to take, I had to take a two day exam that was a total of 12 hours. I had to write 12 essays in a six hour time period, 30 minutes each. And I had to answer 200 questions, um, you know, in, in that time period. And I had to continue to get education 12 hours every single year to keep up and maintain my law license, right? Well, preaching to the choir when you talk to estheticians. We have these same conversations right. with people all the time where you're like, you could go to Sephora to get information on skincare or you could see a professional. So right. your like, um, one other thing you was when I talked to you was that you were like, hey, Sybil, I mean, you could ask for a trademark on this one, but I don't think you're going to get it. So you might want to save your money. So yeah, I was honest with you. And so we, we had a conversation about that and had a lot of conversation about that. And so, you know, you were like, Hey, go back to the drawing board and think what, what you want to do instead. And you gave me options for maybe things that I could do instead. Yeah. I do have to break people's heart a lot of times. Um, and, and sometimes I don't think about that as much because at the end of the day, you're going to get something that's so much greater. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times people will have very generic names or their names are too close to something else that is already registered. And some people will say, well, I'm calling myself the best coach ever. And I want to trademark the best coach ever because I am. And I'm like, I believe you. But <laughs> it's probably not going to happen because that's a descriptive mark. It's merely informational. Too many people can also call themselves the best coach ever. And so it's likely going to fail to function as a trademark. Mm-hmm. And so people don't realize that just because you're using a name, it may not even be eligible for trademark registration. And I'll be and like, I'm, I'm honest with folks. Like sometimes they get on a call with me and I, they tell me their name and I'm like, listen, sister, it's not going to happen. <laughs> here's, here's my podcast listen to episodes nine and six and and you go and you go back to the drawing board and people really appreciate that at the end of the day at least I'm giving you some tools and we can maybe even talk about that how do you even come up with a really awesome trademarkable name right if you want me to drop some tips now I can yeah yeah okay this is fun (laughs) all right rolling up my sleeves okay (laughs) so you can do this a couple different ways. Instead of like, you know, walking through your kitchen and trying to seek inspiration and being like, orange, I'll call myself orange consulting. You know, it's just like, no, there's a better way. Right. <laughs> and so, so one of the great things that you can do is you can use what's called alliteration. Alliteration is the repetition of the same sound in one word or a series of words. Alliteration is actually a great, um, concept to use, uh, in terms of naming your business or your program or your product one, because that, that, that repetition of the sound does something in the ear of the consumer. It also makes your trademark stronger. And it's one of those things that I've actually used when it comes to, um, one of my clients, her trademark was challenged. And I said, well, her trademark also contains alliteration. And because she has alliteration in her mark, that adds a layer of distinctiveness to it that makes it even more eligible for trademark registration. And I believe that that's one of the many at facets that when I argued that as a counter, it allowed her to get a successful trademark registration. So examples of something like this are PayPal, Krispy Kreme, Dunkin' Donuts. Mm-hmm. Always think of the food ones. Uh, mm-hmm. My my company, Business Bakery, right? That repetition of a sound, it also makes it easier for people to remember. It's a great concept to use if you're struggling with naming your brand. Another one that's a little bit more Actually, you did it, Sybil. Skin Fessional. You, it's called a portmanteau. It's the combination of two words that already exist into one word, right? And then when people do it very, very well, it makes a very distinctive, fanciful trademark, one of the strongest that you can have. And also in the mind of your prospective listeners, consumers, whoever, they can already say, oh, I pretty much know what they're going to talk about because of that name. We see that with Skin Fessional, right? (laughs) We see it with Groupon, Groups and Coupon, Pinterest, Pins and Interest, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. They took two words and they combined it to make an even more awesome word. That is such a good, good, that's one of the, you know, I probably get in trouble for saying this, but 
if you can do it right, you may not even need an attorney to trademark your name because <laughs> you basically created a word, yeah. you know? So you created a word for the sole existence of serving as a trademark. So this is what we see like with Kodak and Panasonic. Well, actually it's a little different that those are called fanciful trademarks. They're words that never existed before. Cause if I asked you, what's a Kodak, you'd be like the company. <laughs> yeah. It's not like it's an animal in Australia, you know, it's like <laughs> Kodak. It doesn't mean anything outside of the, the definition that the company gave it as well as like Panasonic. Um, other things that you can do are, you know, going back to that orange example, <laughs> you could name your company something, a word that already exists, but it's not normally associated with um, the product that you're providing, like Uber, Spanx, mm. Lyft, mm. Apple. These are really, really powerful brands. Uh, Target, very powerful brands, words that we already have known all of our lives, but they weren't normally associated with ride share services or supermarket services. Mm. Um, another one that I really like, and I think it's cool for taglines. Um, and even if you're like, you have a, a clothing company, uh, it's something called wordplay. It's very punny. <laughs> and so that means that you're kind of playing off of words. So one wine company named uh, one of their wines Guns and Rosé. Mm -hmm. So they were playing off Guns and Roses, right? Another company that offers charitable mentoring services called their um, company Boys in the Good instead of Boys <laughs> in the Hood. And, you know, it's so cute when they do that because it makes it easy for people to remember and really helps people, um, you know, have a very strong trademark. You just got to walk a fine line with that because you don't want it to be too close that it's trademark infringement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So those are about four or five different things that you can do and kind of leverage and put in your legal toolkit if you're saying, I want to do something new. I want to do something different. I even want to offer a new like trademark signature skincare service and I want to name it something, right? Those are some different naming concepts that you can have in your back pocket as opposed to really just sitting down and trying to force yourself <laughs> to think of something you can say, maybe I can create something that has alliteration or wordplay or, you know, something like that. Yeah. Naming things is hard. So these are great tips. She's just knowledge. Yeah. Yes. There's a lot going on in this brain. Yeah. <laughs> what is the name of your podcast, which I'm going to go binge like ASAP? <laughs> protect, it's protect your smarts. Okay. Yeah, protect everybody, your smart go download, go bookmark, go review five stars, all those things. <laughs> yeah. Cause I mean, yeah. even, I'm already thinking of like, okay, well is the, you know, is this name protectable? Can I trademark this? Can I do this? And so much to think about. Cause also, you know, I know many of our listeners are pivoting into more of the online space. And yeah. like, I mean, if you ask me like, what keeps you up at night? The thought that literally somebody could come in and take over, like they could steal my whole business idea because I haven't done anything to protect it. So please don't be yeah. a hamburger and do that. Um, but like do it right and protect yourself so that you can sleep peacefully at night and not be worried that someone's going to come and like pull the, the rug out from under underneath you, you know? Right. Absolutely. And here's the thing. I'm going to I'm going to step in here and talk to not only you, Alex, but everybody else. Your creative spaces, you know, I say trademarks that that might be the most valuable business asset that you own. But the, your creative space, that's the most valuable thing you have. And you need to protect it at all costs. And many times people don't promote their business to the level in which they should. They don't share. They, 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 they feel like this thing, this resistance pulling them back is because they know they're not protected fully. And so you're really limiting yourself when you don't have your legal house in order because you're protecting your, your, you might say, man, I have this amazing program that I want to do. And you began to let your ideas flow. And the next thing you know, you're like, oh, but I don't have the contracts that I need. Oh, I don't have the trademark that I need. I'm, well, I don't know. Maybe I should put it off until later. And next thing you know, you had this amazing idea and you don't even know if you can pursue it. And then it just sits on the shelf. And I just believe we all have these million dollar, multi-million dollar ideas sitting in our head, but we have to really call ourselves out one is, am I holding myself back? What is it that's holding me back? And let me make a plan to get this underway, whether it be you go into an extended payment plan, you know, and you say, listen, I want to work with you guys. I'm going to pay X amount of money per month. Or can we set up this arrangement until we can get it done? Right. Mm -hmm. Or you figure out what you need to do to make it a priority, because I know that my client's creative space, I have to protect it. That's my job as a creative business attorney. Most other attorneys may not think of that particular vein, but when I think about my clients, I'm like, 
their ideas, everything that's going on in those brains, like we need to protect it at all costs. You know, you see the memes and it's like, protect that man at all costs, right? Mm-hmm. That's how I feel about my clients and their creativity in the creative space. You know, it's very pure. It's a very, very pure space. And so I, I would just encourage you and kind of nudge you a bit to say, okay, identify, because you know a lot of trademark attorneys and you're good friends with them. I know yeah, Kim I know. is... Yeah, Kim is in your program. Like, think about, okay, let me talk with a few people. Let me figure out a plan. What can I do? Where can I work out? Because plenty of people will be happy to support you and other people too, because we get it. Right. But that does bring up also a good point. So I know that you primarily do trademark, but you actually work within a larger group of attorneys as well. Correct? You're- yeah. yeah. Now my, my firm has grown a lot. Yeah. Um, reason we do. You've gotten very large. Yeah. I'm like, what's going on? But I'm, I'm here for it. Um, and so I really just shifted into a space of, Takora, what do your clients need beyond the trademarks? They need contracts. They need business restructuring. They need legal advisement. A lot of our clients are now moving into the realm of licensing their intellectual property. And if we don't keep up, we're going to be left behind. Mm-hmm. And so um, I have hired another full-time associate attorney, um, a paralegal, um, my legal assistant starts next week. I'm moving one team member to operations director because she was kind of handling the, the all of the trademarks. And now we're doing a lot more contract drafting, uh, business restructuring. So we even have programs where on a subscription basis, people can work with us month to month to kind of draw, kind of spread out their legal um, fees over the year. So it's not so much when you're like, oh gosh, whoa, that's a huge bill. It's not mm-hmm. so much whenever you're paying for it over time, mm-hmm. you know, we're doing that work over time. And so it's been really awesome. And so we're taking courses on licensing. We're learning how to do you value trademarks? You know, what is the valuation process? Um, because that's the type of knowledge that people need. Um, mm-hmm. I'm really proud that it's a black owned woman powered law firm. Every woman, every person who works with me is a woman. It just so happens to be that way. They were the best qualified candidates. But in a country where it hasn't been long for women or black folk, <laughs> or really people of color to own things, it yeah. feels really good to be able to say, wow, we're doing something amazing here. We are helping people solidify their legacy because our foremothers and forefathers, they did not have that right. You know, yeah. women would marry and their husbands would say, okay, I'm going to control property. I'm going to control this land. I'm going to take over the inheritance. And we don't have, um, thankfully, that's not the experience today. But I do find because that's the history of this country, country in this world, there's a lot of education that we that has to go into play of why is this important? Yeah. You can see that there are some companies that literally will not close. Toys R Us, for one example, they shut down all the stores, but now they're doing something virtually and they're having pop-ups. And one person said, well, you guys said that you were going to close all the stores. What happened? And one of the company executives said, the intellectual property was just too valuable. <laughs> it's true. Everyone, it was, knows, it, everyone knows Toys R Us. Yeah. Come on now. It just almost gave me chills. He said it was just too valuable to just walk away from. They had to reinvent themselves. Yeah. Um, you know, so yeah. In, in a world where, so we, you know, Alex and I are from California, and I think most people understand movies. In a world where you can remake movies over and over again, and you make the same Marvel films a million times, why wouldn't people understand that that is intellectual property? It's same as Toys R Us is intellectual property. Yeah. A name is a name is a name. And you don't give it up once you own it and you have it. No, you you don't. The cool thing about trademarks too, it's, it's the only intellectual property that could last forever. Right. Patents have a lifespan of 20 years. Copyright will last for as long as the author is alive plus 75 years. Trademarks, as long as you're using it or your family is using it. It can last forever, which is why we've seen businesses be around for a very long time and they retain ownership over their name. So, you know, it's really important uh, when we look at those things and say, wow, when it comes to passing things on, or even if you don't even want to give it to your kids because they're crazy, (laughs) you may want to sell it, you know, because people buy systems. You could create an amazing system and someone says, that's valuable. I like to approach that person and buy it. Well, one of the things they're going to ask is, what does your intellectual property portfolio look like? I would not buy a business if I didn't know that I could have full ownership rights to the name. 
Mm-hmm. And when you don't have a trademark, it's very difficult to be like, this can justify this business price. And they're like, uh, we don't even know if you own the name. Why would I purchase this company? And and the name's not there. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So where can people find you? Tell us all the places they can find you because I think that you might get some customers based on the conversation <laughs> today. Well, I hope so. I'd be honored to serve folks. Um, a lot of people connect with me on my Instagram at Takora Davis. It's my first and last name, T-I-C-O-R-A-D-A-V-I-S. You can also connect with us on Instagram at Creators Law Firm. Um, you can also go to creatorslawfirm.com. Um, it's so funny because now that I've hired it would be, gosh, like four or five. They were working for me part time, but then I'm like, okay, I'm shifting people to full time. Like I've hired like three full time people. I'm looking like everything on my website, and I'm like, oh my god, I look like I'm just so self absorbed because there's just <laughs> pictures of me. And I'm like, we have to redo this whole thing, right? Because there's so many other people. So the website might reflect me. Don't think that I'm full of myself. That's just <laughs> what happened. Well, also um, but- <laughs> recently, because I get the emails, and they're, you're just like, look, new people, new people, new people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's like, who is this new person? So yeah, so um, it's it's exciting. It's exciting stuff. But yeah, you can connect with me there. I would love to be able to um, just connect with people who are associated with the with your audience um, and be able to just you know chat. Let me know what you thought about the show. Like, what did you learn? Um, yeah. Oh, well, I'm excited because I know that there's a bunch of stuff that I that I am I'm in the process of doing with you and more things that I am prepared to, preparing to do as well. Um, I know I will tell everybody that I have had such a good time with Takora. She's been amazing and she's been moving my uh, business forward. Every conversation I have is astounding. Mm-hmm. Oh, thank you so You're much. You're welcome. I'm, I'm so glad that you came on to visit us today. Yes, thank you for too. gracing us with your brilliance and lighting a fire under my bum to protect my smarts. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. You're welcome. Well, thank you guys so much. And I always just express my sincere gratitude. There was a time when I started this law firm that I didn't know if anybody would listen to me. And so it's really an honor still to this day for people to ask me and say, we think that you have something of value to share. So it means a lot to be asked. And so I just want to thank you all for allowing me to be shared with your audience. That that says a lot. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you. Have a good one. Bye. 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 All right. Well, that was absolutely incredible. My mind is blown. I feel so incredibly lucky once again that I'm working with attorney Davis. (laughs) (laughs) There's a funny story, but I guess we'll have to share drinks with you to tell you the story behind that. Or Um, you can ask us by going to, you know, our DMs or uh our skin professional box. Yes, yes, yes. So definitely we want to know what you thought about today's episode. I know Takora put a uh, ask for you as well. If you learn something like hit us up on social. Let us know. Uh, you can find the show at Skin Fessional. Um, Sybil is at Your Skin Fitness Experts. And I am at Hala Famala. Um, let us know. What did you think? You got questions? Your biggest takeaway? Send us all the things. And if you're like, I would like to do it the old-fashioned way and you want to leave us a voicemail, we do have a box? Yes, it's 818-473-5277. And I know that many of us are old fashioned. So leave us a voicemail there. I don't even call my mom. I text my mother. Like, I'm not (laughs) being honest. (laughs) It's true. So guys, until next week, keep your secrets to yourself. Unless you're telling us. Okay, bye. Bye.